Hey there, ghosts, ghouls, and things that go bump in the night. I hope your week has been better than mine. I'll be honest with you guys. I just wasn't ready to talk about what's been going on with me last week. But I think it's only fair that you guys hear all about what's been happening with me for the last couple of weeks and why I'm trying to find out everything I can about this scroll I have. But to really understand why this scroll is so important, I need to tell you about Naomi. Because, after all, this really is her story. So, I met Naomi shortly after I turned 18, on our college campus. It was the first day of classes, and I was lost. I was supposed to be going to room G105, but when I walked through the front doors of the building, all of the rooms started with a 2. I must have walked up and down that hallway like five times, trying to figure out how on earth to get downstairs. Where the heck is this place? I muttered to myself. I was getting frustrated. I glanced through the window pane of the door that led to the back stairwell to go upstairs and the emergency exit. From my angle, it looked as though the stairs leading up to the second floor and the exit doors were all that were to be found in that small entryway. Uh, hey, excuse me. Are you looking for the ground floor? I had a class there earlier and I'm headed that way. I could show you how to get downstairs. A voice interrupted my grumblings. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure, that'd be great, I guess, I replied. Before me stood a young woman, approximately my age, about 5'2". <laughs> Honestly, compared to my 5'9 self, she seemed pretty minuscule. But at the same time, I got the impression that messing with her would end up with the opposer on the ground. I'm Naomi, she said, gesturing for me to follow her. Naomi Johnson, I'm studying to be a teacher. What about you? Oh, hey, I replied. I'm studying to be a teacher too. Small world, I guess. Are you going to Dr. Terry's class? <laughs> yeah, yeah, are we going to the same place? It'll be nice to already know someone. She laughed lightly and led me to a stairwell tucked behind the emergency entrance. I guess that makes us best friends. Little did Naomi know, she had predicted that absolutely correctly. While neither of us actually ended up becoming teachers, we both changed our majors and went in different studies our sophomore year, but we were inseparable from that day on. Even now, in our 30s, that hasn't really changed. We only live about an hour apart, and while we definitely have our own separate lives, we always make time for each other. Whether it's just silly late night chats, or hanging out for a movie night, because let's be real, priorities. And that's why when I found out that my grandparents had bought the house next door to theirs, the house that I had heard my whole life was haunted. I knew Naomi would want to go explore it. See, Naomi has always loved spooky things. She's actually what got me into horror. I guess growing up watching Halloween and The Exorcist and the like, just does that to a person. So, when I suggested checking out the creepy house next to my grandparents, Naomi was immediately on board. Unsurprisingly, finding a good time for the two of us to actually get together was easier said than done. It took months before Naomi and I were actually available on the same weekend. I was really tempted to go see the house while waiting. I even visited my grandparents a few times, but I resisted the temptation to go without her. In 
In fact, by the week before Naomi was due to visit, I felt like the house was just calling to me. I was dreaming about it at night and daydreaming about it during the day. I didn't really understand why I was so pulled to that house. I had been in it once or twice as a kid when my grandparents' old neighbor still lived there. Her name was Doris. I remember her as a nice older lady, even when I was a kid, with white hair, big glasses, this friendly dog, his name was Fred, and more cats running around outside than anybody ought to have. She used to go for walks with us sometimes, and she would tell us all about when she used to work at a nurse at the local state hospital. It wasn't until I got a little older, and Doris wasn't around much anymore, that I realized state hospital was just a nice way of saying psychiatric institution. Once I learned that, it made a whole lot more sense why she would talk about locking the patient's doors at night, and how she sometimes heard wailing, and how all of her patients used to talk in nonsense. She even told me once, in passing, that sometimes the patients would give her gifts, usually just junk, sometimes handmade crafts, but sometimes even baubles and jewelry. Dora said she would never keep anything of true value. That would be unethical. But she had kept a few trinkets from patients that she felt drawn to. I guess in that profession, you do what you have to do to keep going and to try and keep the peace. Finally, the time came. Naomi got to my house pretty late on Friday night. We stayed up late drinking wine and watching ghost movies, because, duh. But eventually, we decided we should talk about the plans for the next day and try to get some sleep. Naomi's heard all the stories I know about Doris and her house, and she was really excited to finally go see it in person. Funny enough, it turned out Naomi had been having dreams about the house. We compared dreams lightly, and it turns out they were weirdly similar. We'd both seen flashes of the home, inside and out, which was doubly weird for Naomi considering she'd never been inside. Just heard me explain what I remembered from when I was a kid. We also had seen red eyes, a beautiful necklace draped over a vanity, and then draped over a woman's body instead. <laughs> We've obviously been watching the same movies, I chuckled. We eventually went to bed exhausted, but were up at first light to get ready for our visit. We quickly got around before hopping in Naomi's car. We figured it was in poor form to visit a haunted house on an empty stomach, so we stopped for waffles first. During breakfast, Naomi confided in me she'd had the dream again. This time, the necklace was even clearer. It was a locket, she confirmed, and she knew in the dream there was something really important inside. This time, instead of being draped over a body, it was draped over a scroll, just sitting on Doris's wardrobe. I'm really curious about it now, she told me, while fiddling with her own long pendant around her neck. I wonder if I'll find it at the house. <laughs> That's weird, I told her. I didn't dream at all last night. I was totally expecting to, too. Uh, I guess you better be on the lookout for that necklace. I laughed. If I had realized then how wrong I was, I wouldn't have even suggested we go to the house. I would have found something else, anything else for us to do that day. But only hindsight is twenty twenty. We finished our breakfasts and were on our way to Doris's house. It only took about half an hour to get there, and by the time we did, we were both practically vibrating with excitement. Parking and jumping out of the car, we quickly stopped at my grandparents to say hi, catch up, and grab the keys, and then we were off, crossing the yard between Doris' house and my grandparents and unlocking her back door. The door opened into a laundry room 
which led to the kitchen and dining area. The first thing we saw as we walked in was a large freezer unit, but we tactily agreed to leave that alone. Nothing good ever comes out of those things, and we weren't trying to be final girls here. Plus, I wasn't sure the electric was still working anyway, and nobody wants to smell that. Walking into the kitchen, we spied a door. Let's go upstairs, Naomi blurted out right away. Nah, I said. She's got tons of stuff sitting around her living room. She was practically a hoarder. I think I'm going to check out down here first. Suit yourself, she shrugged and headed up the stairs. Careful, I shouted after her. I'm not sure how solid those steps are. I stayed on the ground floor exploring the dining room and the living room before returning to the kitchen, and I eventually found that that closed door led to the basement. Opening the door slightly, I flipped the light switch over the stairs, and to my shock and great surprise, a single bulb flickered meager light into the stairs, barely illuminating a dozen rickety wooden steps, and not much beyond it. Dude, I shouted, circling back to the living room to call up the stairs where Naomi had disappeared. You should come back down here. I found the basement. It's super creepy. It's just a dirt floor. I bet there are bodies buried down there. Oh, hey, also, watch your step when you come back down, I shouted as I walked away back towards the basement. These floorboards are feeling pretty flimsy. No sooner had I gotten the words out when suddenly... The floorboards in the kitchen fell out, and I was suddenly in a pile on the basement floor. Ow. Clutching my sore wrist and swearing under my breath, I picked myself up and assessed other injuries. My head didn't feel too great, but there was no blood. I'm still not sure how I managed that. I shuddered when I looked at the filth in the basement, imagining the tetanus shots I was going to have to get. Man, it was dark down there, and while I admit I consider myself a pretty brave person, I was pretty sure those beady red eyes staring at me were way too high to be on the floor, and without any lights except for that dim bulb on the stairs, I wasn't about to try and figure out what exactly those eyes were. I quickly climbed the stairs to get back to the main floor but the door that I had opened only moments before, when I peered down the first time, absolutely refused to budge. Getting a little concerned, I threw my shoulder into it, which only served to jar my already injured arm, but did absolutely nothing to get the door open. Suddenly, a blast of cold hit me, and I was shoved back down the stairs. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought ghostly hands were pushing against my shoulders. It felt like a human being pushing me away. Before I could even scream, the lights flickered out with a pop. That's it, I thought to myself, trying to get myself back together sitting on the basement floor. I'm out of here. I was officially freaked out, and I was in some serious pain. Multiple falls will do that to you. I needed to find Naomi and get out of this house. What if the upstairs was rotting like the kitchen? I didn't want Naomi to fall. Two stories? That wouldn't end well for her. Remembering my cell phone, I pulled it out and tried to call her. It had smashed in my pocket when I fell. Whether the fall from the kitchen did it or the tumble down the steps was anyone's guess. I reached the top of the stairs again, cradling my arm and still, the door wouldn't budge. By now, the pain in my wrist was nothing compared to the hot terror burning in the back of my throat. I didn't know exactly what was happening. I just knew I needed to get Naomi, and I needed to get out. Now. The house was starting to shake, and I could hear the supports groaning and crackling. The house wasn't stable, and I'm pretty sure it was going to come down. Naomi! I shouted as large as I could and battered myself against the door. I can still see the scrapes and splinters now as I'm telling you this. The cold breeze was biting the back of my neck and I swore I heard laughter and felt hands pulling at me. Naomi! 
Then, blinding light, and I fell into the kitchen. Naomi had opened the door. What the hell happened to you, dude? She asked me. But something about her voice was off. Distant, almost. The words were there, but the inflection wasn't. Naomi was a lot of things, but if she had heard me screaming like I knew I had been, she wouldn't be staring at me like I was boring her. She may have loved scary things, but she was also the first person to tell the final girl to GTFO of a bad situation. Naomi, we have to get out of here now. Something really weird is going on down there, and I don't like the way that floor collapsed. I'm pretty sure the house is going to go. No. This is where I'm supposed to be. You go. Dude, I'm not leaving you here. What is going on? Come on, we've got to go. As I tried to pull Naomi from the house, her eyes changed, no longer shuddered. She seemed like her old self for a split second, and suddenly lurched towards me. Go! Forget about me! You gotta get out of here! Caught off balance by her sudden mood change, I stumbled out of the doorway and onto the lawn. Then the house shuddered, and the roof caved in. No! Scrambling back to what had been the doorway, I frantically shouted, Naomi, can you hear me? Where, where are you? I have never been as terrified as I was in that moment. I started frantically rooting through the wreckage, searching the area where I last found her. She couldn't have gotten far before the roof collapsed. I was going to find her. She had to be fine. She was my best friend. She couldn't be gone. She couldn't have disappeared. Why would she do that? I was asking myself over and over while digging through the rubble. We both could have gotten out. She was right there. Why didn't I grab her? After what seemed like an hour of searching, though in reality was probably only a few seconds, I found her. Converse first, half hidden under part of the roof. Miraculously, or maybe not miraculously, it seems as though a large peaked section of the roof fell over her and probably saved her life from all of the falling debris. While she appeared to be unconscious, she didn't have any apparent injuries, apart from some small cuts and bruises, but her face and her neck seemed fine. I knew it was risky to move her, not knowing her condition, but the house was still rumbling, and that decided it for me. I wasn't going to risk Naomi and the house collapsing all the way into the foundation. I was getting her out of there. Sliding her from the wreckage proved tricky, but I was finally able to get her onto the lawn. Thankfully, my grandparents had heard the commotion and had already called for help. An ambulance and a fire department were on the scene just a few minutes later, and Naomi seemed to be coming back around. The paramedics were asking me all kinds of questions about where she was when the roof collapsed, how was I able to find her in the wreckage, where she was located, all the usual questions, I guess. They finally let me talk to her before they finished loading her in the ambulance. What happened? Naomi asked me groggily. Her eyes were still closed and her voice was faint. You scared the crap out of me, that's what happened, I snapped. What on earth were you thinking? She blearily opened her eyes, and for a moment my best friend was back. She looked confused. I don't remember, she said. The last thing I remember was looking through Doris's bedroom. She had so many beautiful things. Her silver comb. She still had flowers dried on her bureau. And her jewelry box. So many beautiful things. Her hand lifted. I thought she was going to reach for me, but instead, it rose to her throat where a small locket rested. My heart stopped. That wasn't the pendant she'd been wearing when we left this morning. In fact, if I didn't know any better, I would say it was the necklace that I had seen in my dreams. My dreams of this house. I grabbed her hand away and held it all the while staring at the locket. 
My brain was working overtime, but still, I didn't have all the pieces, and the paramedics were headed back our way. I was running out of time, and that feeling of dread was back. Where did you get that necklace? I asked her, frantically. As if mentioning it reminded Naomi she was still wearing it, she reached up to touch the locket still nestled against her throat. It's mine. You can't have it. Suddenly, Naomi's bright eyes were once again blood red. The EMT spoke up. She's got to go to the hospital and get checked out. You ought to get checked out, too. You can talk to her again once we get there. Plus, the police are going to want your statement, too. My gut was still screaming something wasn't right. Just, just wait a sec. Before I could finish my statement, Naomi reached up, grabbed the EMT, and brought his head down over her knee. The EMT crumpled, and Naomi leapt off the stretcher and crouched by the door of the ruined house. No, she shouted. You can't make me go with you. I have to go. I have important things to do and people to visit. They'll pay for what they did. Naomi, I don't understand what you're saying. I desperately tried to reason with her. Okay, dude, I think you've got a concussion. You're not acting right. Let me help you. We can go together, okay? Come on. Let's just go talk to a doctor. No. Go away. I can do this myself. Before I could reach her, Naomi sprinted towards her car, locking the door and turning the engine over before I could even process what had happened. The squealing of tires and the kick of gravel signified Naomi peeling out of the drive. Where she was going was anyone's guess, but I had a sinking suspicion it wasn't anywhere good. As I turned away from Naomi's fleeing vehicle, trying to just pick up the pieces and figure out what had happened, I noticed a small parchment bound up like a scroll. She must have left it behind. I stuck it in my pocket before anybody else saw it. And that, listeners, is where I'm at now. I've looked over the scroll, and I'm at a loss. I know this can help explain what happened to Naomi. I know there's more to this story. And I'm not going to rest until I've figured it out. My first problem is, I can't read it. And, trust me... I can read a lot of languages. It's kind of my thing. But I won't stop until I've figured this out. I won't stop until I get my best friend back. I know she'd do the same thing for me. So that's why I've been away the last couple of weeks. I needed a little time for my wrist to heal and to track down some people better suited to squirrel reading. I know I'm supposed to be resting, but I can't. Not knowing Naomi, or at least Naomi's body, is still out there somewhere, and knowing she needs help. I don't know exactly what happened while I was trapped in the basement, but I will figure it out, and I will get her back. I've got a plan, and I'll update you once I know more, but until then, as always, I'll have other fun stories of the strange and unusual here. After all... I need something to take my mind off this scroll, even if it's only for a short while. So, until we meet again, listeners, thanks for sticking with me. Stay spooky, and remember, sometimes it's more than just a story.